Welcome to Engineering Influence, a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Today, we are uh, kind of playing cleanup from the 2022 Annual Convention and Legislative Summit, which was a fantastic event uh, at the end of May back at the Grand Hyatt downtown in D.C., and we had a very, very packed exhibit hall, uh, which we're kind of getting used to because we haven't been to the Grand Hyatt in a while, and uh, it was it was a very crowded which is good, uh, but uh, a busy place. And we weren't able to get to everyone we wanted to get to at the event. And that includes uh, what we're talking about today. And that is uh, our friends at Risk Strategies. And to talk about uh, what Risk Strategies does and why uh, they are important to the ACEC community, I'm very pleased to be joined by Darren Black, he is a senior managing director and national practice leader at Risk Strategies. Darren, thanks for coming on to the show. It's my pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me. You know, it was it was a it was a crowded crowded uh, room uh, at convention, so I'm glad we could do this when we have a little bit more uh, peace and quiet. It was indeed, yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Risk Strategies. Uh, you're you're no stranger to ACEC and the AE community, uh, but. Uh, you know, what is your what you know, what kind of separates you from from some other providers in your space? And, and, and uh, tell us a little bit more about about the company. Sure. Uh, Risk Strategies is different in that it is a, a billion dollar commercial risk and employee benefits, human capital, all things risk management, insurance and those types of things. But embedded within that very large brokerage, if you will, um, is a team of people um, spread across the country. Uh, we've got more than 60 folks that uh, are dedicated to serving the needs of engineers and architects, uh, design professionals generally. Um, so we've got geographic breadth. We've got a number of people like myself who are, are former practicing attorneys that have defended professional liability litigation uh, that have served in-house uh, to ENR 200 and up firms, and others that, that bring significant tenure as senior underwriters, um, mm -hmm. claims directors, leading professional liability uh, claims departments at, at prominent insurers. So we bring a diversity of backgrounds that uh, hopefully allows us to get to that point with our more than 5,000 design firm clients around the country to be their trusted advisor, their consultant, and to really assist them in ways that go way beyond the insurance transaction, which is kind of just the blocking and tackling. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an interesting time for the industry because a lot is happening. Uh, there's been a lot of change, um, especially now that we're in a kind of a post COVID environment. I mean, I think that was a great, you know, that was a reshuffling the deck on priorities and things that firms might not have thought about now coming out of the pandemic, they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what their risk exposure is, how to mitigate a lot of risk and how to kind of deal with, um, you know, the, the, the dealing with clients and, 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 and their own business. But then it's also been a time of upheaval in technology and in the way that projects are delivered, you know, in your mind, just given your experience, you know, on, you know, like you said, risk strategies has people on both sides of the house, people who have uh, experience in underwriting, people like yourself who have the experience in in litigating these matters in the courts. You know, in your mind, what, what's the been the biggest shift within our space that you've seen uh, with with some of the members that you talk to? What, what are the what, what's the big change? Well, I, I just think. Things have expanded. Uh, technology has had such a huge impact mm -hmm. on the profession um, that obviously impacts general counsel and CFO's perspective. It used to be only the professional liability that really kept them awake at night. But uh, engineering firms and professional services firms generally have been such huge targets of all of the ransomware cyber attacks. And, and that now keeps folks up at night. Yeah. Um, we're dealing with increased exposures. We're dealing with sustainability and adaptability with respect to climate change and its implications on morphing the standard of care, bringing uncertainties there. And we're doing it in an environment where 
it's so tough to attract and retain talent. Um, the passage of the infrastructure bill, yeah. for example, you know, only adds to the glut of uh, contract backlog that so many of our client firms have. And there's just uh, the professions seem to be ravaging themselves for that talent. It makes it hard to, to properly staff projects that need good project management skills and talents. So um, it seems like there's a lot more mm -hmm. on in-house risk managers desks than there ever was. And hopefully we're able to help facilitate solutions yeah. in any number of those issues that may come up. Yeah, that from a policy perspective, I mean, what we're focused on, of course, to your point is the pipeline issue. It's it's the fact that we know that the infrastructure bill is going to create 82,000 new jobs in engineering and, and you have downstream employment effects with that as well. And the question is, where do, where do we get the talent? Um, and for firms that are looking to hire or, or have, a, have a position available or multiple positions available and they're still trying to keep the project workload up, uh, having fewer people working on those projects, um, issues related to the contracts with those projects. I mean, those are those are all things that I, I don't think gets get get enough attention because you know the policymakers always look at the of course the legislation itself and they say, okay, this is great. You know, we're going to be funding this many billions of dollars of infrastructure investment. But for the firms that are actually doing the design work and the work, of course, our member firms do comes in beginning um, of the project, but has a has an impact throughout the project life cycle. Um, issues related to talent and how many people are working on those projects and what's acceptable. And, and, and that, that, those are things that don't get a lot of attention. Um, so it's 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 good that you raise that issue. Um, you know what? With, is that is that something that you're seeing across the board with firms of all sizes? I mean, from the from the top firms and the ENR, you know, you know, 100 all the way down to to the smaller mid-sized firms. I think it's become a bigger issue, perhaps, for the mid-sized and smaller firms. It seems like the larger firms are able to fund acquisitions that allow them to to bring about the necessary expertise to take on the projects, utilizing some of the new technologies we touched on earlier. Um, but certainly it's an industry-wide issue um, across the board. I just think the ability to deal with the implications of the talent shortage right now, perhaps the larger firms have a little bit more flexibility and options than is the case, you know, outside the ENR 500, for example. Yeah, and you also mentioned some of the uh, environmental and sustainability issues that are becoming much more popular. Um are you noticing that more on the firm side or the client side when it comes to ESG? Both. I think those firms that can mm -hmm. demonstrate to their prospective clients, if you will, their commitment to sustainability and the ability to have that kind of macro conversation with clients about lifetime costs as opposed to perhaps incrementally higher materials costs on the front end, for example. I think they have a a marketing advantage that uh, that firms that haven't paid as close attention mm -hmm. just don't have. I, I think there are a lot of owners out there that are very yeah. interested in in trying to better understand what their project can be in terms of sustainability and adaptability and all of the issues that have been talked about so frequently over recent years. And that's that's where I, I, I would say that, you know, what you mentioned as a trusted advisor relationship with risk strategies really comes into play. The fact that you would be able to come in to um, a firm that might not have put a lot of focus in on this issue and are realizing or, or you know from their own business and they're realizing that this change in kind of the marketplace with this demand by clients that uh, they take into consideration these long-term environmental impacts and, and kind of these softer metrics uh, that they want to be able to tout as project owners whether it's, you know, a public sector client or a private sector client, how, you know, how do you, how does risk strategies kind of enter into that from a, from an advisory role with a firm that might want to, uh, might not have the infrastructure in place to deal with that, but wants to kind of get really get going. Before we have gained that trusted advisor role at the inception of a relationship, um, one of the first things we do is, uh, 
sit down with firm leadership and review the way they present themselves to the underwriting market. Uh, all of these issues that we've been talking about are also taking place within the context of a hardening professional liability market in particular. We could talk about cyber, we could talk about commercial auto, but yeah. but again, professional liability tends to be engineering firms' biggest spend. It's what tends to keep their general counsel or risk management staff up at night. Um, and where we can really quickly demonstrate um, and differentiate ourselves is by pointing out to firm leadership that underwriters are paying attention to the very issues that we're talking about. And if we can help them articulate what they're doing in recognition of the heightened risks and what they're doing to mitigate those risks, we can save them money. Mm -hmm. It happens to be the case yeah. that in the process of better presenting themselves from a risk management perspective, of course, that drives profits. But if they're having to articulate what they're doing for the underwriters, they can do so for their clients as well. And it has implications well beyond, like I said, the insurance transaction. So um, we, we kind of get involved incrementally. It starts with that. And if we can do a good job of convincing them that we can bring value in the way they present themselves from a, from a recognition of risk and mitigation thereof perspective, um, that tends to blend into a whole bunch of areas that have to do with the profitability of the firm. And so that's kind of the inception of that trusted advisor role. And that's that's critically important um, because it's analogous to the engineering firms talking to their end clients um, and, and the same way of, of trying to uh, 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 kind of broach this relationship and 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 kind of it's it's that partnership right. approach right. which is uh, extremely important. How long? I mean, Risk Strategies has been working with ACEC for a while now. Um, I mean, how many how many conventions have you been to? Well, it's interesting. The practice that I just referred to. Um, that in the aggregate out of seven or eight different cities around the country serves thousands of design firms. Um, it, it just within the last few years um, used to be a confederacy, if you will. Um, Risk Strategies has acquired a number of boutique professional liability agencies that had very significant market share and great client relationships in their respective geographies. I came on board a little over three years ago to bring those agencies together into the singular holistic practice that it now is, implementing shared best practices and um, you know, same deliverables uh, across the country. Um, and the ability for all of our clients, regardless of where they may be located, to tap into those resources and expertise that we talked about earlier. Um, so prior to maybe five years ago, all of those offices were strong, staunch supporters of both the ACEC and for that matter, the AIA and other organizations, ASCII and so on, mm -hmm. um, in their respective jurisdictions, if you will. Um, but we've had a much yeah. bigger presence at a national level just within the last three or four years. And, and it's fantastic. The recent yeah. uh, get together, um, in D.C. allowed us to catch up with a lot of our clients that were in attendance in a social setting that um, could take place without an agenda. Nobody was worrying about a renewal or a claim or anything along those lines. And those are just great opportunities to to further and foster those types of relationships that we're talking about. Yeah, it's a great way to kind of keep those relationships going and just just talk about what's new and, and, and uh, have those kind of stress free conversations. Uh, when everyone's together uh, and and kind of on the same page, so it's 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 great, and we do hope to uh, to see you guys again uh, when we meet in October uh, in Colorado. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see you uh, at the Broadmoor um, for our fall convention. It's a beautiful spot. We look forward to it. Yeah, could be worse places to Indeed. meet. Um, and. And again, you know, we do appreciate you uh, uh, being the an exhibitor and, and and sponsor for the the 2022 annual convention. It was a great event. Uh, back again, like I said at the start, you know, at the Grand Hyatt, uh, new geography, so so kind of a a, a new exhibit hall. And uh, for anyone there who was not able to meet up with Darren and his group at Risk Strategies, I do. Uh, I recommend that you go online to uh, risk-strategies.com. 
and the practice areas, you'll see architecture and engineering, and uh, you'll get some good information there, and uh, Darren's contact is on that page. So, uh, uh, Darren, I do appreciate the time you've taken today, uh, uh, and I'm glad that we could connect after the event. Better late than never. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate the time. Always. Yeah, look forward to having you back on the show. Uh, just, you know, drop us a line if there's something significant happening in your space, if there's a, a change or if there's something that you think our members should know, please just let us know. We'll have you back on. Thank you again. Wonderful. And again, this has been Engineering Influence, a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies with Darren uh, with Risk Strategies. And uh, we will see you again. Take care. Take care.